Uh, bienvenue à toutes et tous. Uh, welcome to this evening's celebrations of research and the Osler. I'm Mary Hay Gierl, head of the Osler Library of the History of Medicine. My pronouns are she, her, you, elle. Nous commençons ce soir en reconnaissant que l'Université McGill est sur un emplacement um, qui a longtemps servi de lieu de rencontre et d'échange entre les peuples autochtones. Uh, McGill University is located on land which has long served as a state site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe nations. We honor, recognize, and respect these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters from which we are presenting today. The Oslo Library is one of McGill's greatest gifts coming midway through the bicentennial upon which the university has been reflecting this year. Osler bequeathed the library to the McGill medical faculty for the use of the entire medical profession, but very specifically for medical students, so they could appreciate firsthand the works that lay the foundations of their future profession, their vocation. The Osler library currently from its place in the umbrella collective of McGill Roar, which is rare books, Osler art and archives, continues to realize Osler's vision, a vision that was not for a static library, but for a vibrant dynamic one. One that via continued collection development would remain relevant to an ever-changing medical profession, a changing medical student body. Today at the Osler Library, we strive to engage students on fun topics, but also on serious and very difficult ones. We aim to instill an appreciation for the relevance of the past to present day concerns. In terms of details for today, I wanna to let you know that uh, we are recording this event. Um, so keep that in mind. And also to please, we'll make a note, but to please put your questions in the chat as we go along so that as each speaker comes to an end, if we have time, we can start getting to those questions right away. And next, uh, in the spirit of encouraging all manner of medical student engagement, it brings me immense pleasure to pass the virtual mic to one of this year's Med uh, McGill Ozer Society co-presidents, Simon Arfe, who last year had the distinction of being the Domaster of Family Essay Award winner. Uh, Simon will lead you through the panel as this evening's moderator. Simon. Thank you. I would like to begin by thanking Dr. Higirl, who is the head Osler librarian and a scholar of history. Thanks to her dedication, support, and guidance, we continue to excel today. Good evening, friends, colleagues, and honored guests. Happiest of welcomes and salutations to you. My name is Salman Arfei. I'm a second year doctor of medicine and a master of surgery candidate at McGill and one of the co-presidents of the McGill Ozer Society. I also would like to welcome our co-president, Ard who's a your medical student who is with us today. On behalf of the Board of Curators of the Osler Library and of the History of Medicine, it brings me great joy and a distinguished pleasure to welcome you to this virtual event. And what you will observe in the next two hours will be a marriage between medicine and the humanities. We are excited and proud to showcase the great work that is conducted by medical students here at McGill University and faculty. Today, you will be hearing from Lily Grossman, Brendan Ross, and Professor Faith Willis. I will be sharing a brief background to each before their presentations. But in light of keeping time with the event, uh, I also like to thank uh, the, uh, the generous uh, gift that was made possible by Pam and Rolando Del Maestro. Dr. Del Maestro is what I would consider without question a renaissance man par excellence. Neurosurgeon, scientist, author, innovator, educator, writer, thinker, and leader, and most importantly, great friend. He's an inspirational mentor and continues to mentor many students in McGill University, and uh, many students benefit from his insight and guidance, myself being one of them. Having retired as a director of the Brain Tumor Research Center uh, and uh, from his clinical practice in brain tumor surgery in 2012, Dr. Del Meister currently devotes his time and attention for advancing novel techniques, education, and preserving historical medical treasures. Here we have Dr. Del Maestro as a chairperson of the Standing Committee of the Osler Library and of the History of Medicine in McGill, and he would like to share some words and thoughts uh, alongside with his wife, Pam. So the floor is yours, Dr. Del Maestro and Pam. Well, thank you very much, Simon. First, I'd like to thank all the uh, speakers today because uh, 
clearly that they're the, they're the important part of uh, today's uh, uh, experience. Lily and uh, Brendan, and um, also with Professor uh, Wallace. Uh, and second, I'd like to also thank Mary and all the other individuals who have been involved in putting this together. I think Pam and I feel that this is one of the more important things that we've been involved with. And we uh, continue to hope that it can, uh, will inspire young uh, medical students and older medical students and older people too, like ourselves, to uh, think a little bit more about uh, the humanities and how the humanities affect us on a moment-to-moment on -moment basis. And I'll pass over to Pam for, uh, for a few thoughts also here. Well, I mean, the only thing I can say is that this is different. It's unique. It challenges us and you, young and old, to look at medicine from different angles and different time periods and different epochs of, of thoughts. And as Roland always says to me, you know, we reinvent the past and the future. So everything is different every time we hear a talk and we learn new things from everything. So I am really excited about tonight. So, uh, so Man, we'll turn it back to you and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing these wonderful talks today. Thank you very much, Dr. Delmeister and Pam. So as Dr. Yurl has already mentioned in the chat, uh, if you have any questions, please redirect them in the chat and we will be moderating it. Just a brief idea about the structure of the events. So we have three presentations. Uh, the first two will be by our medical students for 15 minutes each. These would be followed by a five minute Q&A session. Uh, we will be moderating the chat as I mentioned already. So if there's questions, please, please, please leave it there. This would then be followed by a 30 minute lecture by Professor Wallace and a five minute Q&A, and then we will open the floor to questions if there are more, okay? So now we can hopefully get started with the next slide and the first speaker. I'll be reading the biography of our first speaker. So Lily Grossman is a first year medical student at McGill University, born and raised in Montreal. She has always been fascinated by her city's rich history. Outside of academics, Lily enjoys traveling, running, hiking, or anything where she can discover what the world has to offer. Lily is also presenting as a finalist for the Pam and Rolanda Del Maestro family William Osler Medical Student Essay Award. Lily will discuss uh, Dr. Samuel Rabinovich and the Montreal intern strike of 1934 in her talk titled, as you can see in the slide, Untold Medical History, Montreal's Days of Shame. And before I pass it on to Lily, I also like to thank Dr. Rabinovich's family, his son, Dr. Mark Rabinovich, who works at the MGH, and Dr. Marlene Rabinovich, who will be joining us from California, Stanford. Thank you, Lily, and uh, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Saman, for the wonderful introduction. So I'm here to present the essay that I wrote for the Osler Medical Student Awards that was generously supported by the Del Maestro family. And my talk tonight, as Simon mentioned, will be focusing on the Montreal Days of Shame. I'm really hoping that by the end of my presentation, our listeners are going to be somewhat better aware of the history of racism in Montreal, and more precisely, the relationship between Montreal's medical history and anti-Semitism. So to start off, I wanted to say that it's such an honor to be here presenting tonight, and I'm really grateful to all of our listeners. A special thank you to the Del Maestro family, because without them, this evening wouldn't be possible. I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Weiss, who took the time to guide me through this whole process of writing this essay, because prior to this paper, I've actually never written a history essay before, and I've never done any sort of archival research, but this competition gave me that very opportunity. I'd like to thank Dr. Ural, who answered all my questions so promptly, as well as Janice Rosen at the Jewish Canadian Archives. It's an honor to have with us this evening, Dr. Samuel Rabinovich's family. So Dr. Mark Rabinovich, Dr. Marlene Rabinovich, and Dr. Noah Robbins, thank you so much for coming. It's also an honor to have with us Dr. Baron Lerner, who wrote a history of medicine piece in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Thank you for coming as well. Now here's a brief overview of my presentation, but due to time constraints, I'll be getting right into it. So since I only have 15 minutes and because I primarily want to focus on Dr. Rabinovich, I don't have time to cover all there is to know about anti-Semitism during this time period. But I really wanna give the 1934 hospital strike some context. In North America, there was a massive wave of Jewish immigrants in the first half of the 20th century. 
And as you can imagine, at the time, there were two prominent population groups in Quebec. There was the Anglophone Protestant population and the Roman Catholic French Canadians. Both these groups had very strong sentiments towards preserving their sense of identities. So obviously this massive influx of immigrants who came from a completely different cultural background and a completely different way of life served as somewhat of a threat to the rest of the Quebec population. As a result, anti-Semitism and xenophobia were manifested in many different ways. In the 1920s, there was the Asha Chenou campaign, which was born to encourage Quebec nationalists to buy products from their fellow French Canadians. The campaign was generally aimed at boycotting small Jewish businesses. Now on the right of the presentation, I put a photo of Adrien Arcan, who was a particularly passionate Asha Chenou supporter, and he fashioned himself as the Canadian Fuhrer. He said a lot of things that I didn't even feel comfortable putting in this presentation, but he, overall, he further contributed to an unwelcomed atmosphere for Jews in Quebec. He was also a journalist in Montreal, and he published a weekly series of propaganda cartoons. So I put some of those on the left of the screen. You can see them. For many Ashkenazi immigrants, education represented the best prospect for social mobility. And this could explain why Jews sought to become physicians in far larger proportions than any other Canadian subpopulation. Now to correct this so-called racial imbalance, race conscious admission policies were established in numerous institutions. These policies obviously not only targeted Jews, but also targeted women, African Canadians, indigenous populations, Irish Catholics, and as well other ethnic minorities. On the left, you can see a photo that I took from one of the archives that I used. This was a letter written by Ira Mackay, who was at the time the Dean of Faculty of Arts at McGill University. And he wrote this letter to Sir Arthur Curry on April 23rd, 1926. So overall in this letter, what Mackay is trying to tell us or tell Sir Arthur Curry is that he was concerned about the rising Jewish student population at McGill. And in the letter, he specifically writes, there can be no doubt about the danger of the university in every way of entertaining a large number of Jews. In the middle column, I inserted a photo at the top of Abbe Lionel Grou. And so he was a Canadian Catholic priest, historian, and Quebec nationalist. And below him, I put a picture of Henri Bourassa, a French Canadian nationalist political leader. Both of them used anti-Semitism as a scapegoat to explain widespread unemployment in Quebec. Now, in terms of restriction quotas, McGill University's quota was the longest standing in all of Canada. It was first adopted in the 1920s and lasted up until the late 1960s. University of Montreal did not necessarily have a Jewish quota, but this could be explained because there were far less Jewish students at UDM compared to McGill. Now the presence of Jews there was not opposed by the administration, but their legitimacy, but the legitimacy of the presence of Jews in a Catholic university was highly contested by the student body. So this is what I just stated is what I found in one archive. But then after I analyzed the 1934 hospital strike, I found another article in the Montreal Gazette that stated there actually was a quota at UDM for Jews that was instilled that was established after the 1934 hospital strike. So all that being said, the information published out there is not entirely clear, but we do know that these quotas existed. Okay, so now I'll be getting into like the main part of my paper, which is the hospital strike. In February, 1934, Montreal Hôpital Notre Dame hired a group of new French Canadian interns for the 1934 to 1935 intern year. All the positions were filled by French Canadian Catholics, but the last position, the last position was filled by a French speaking Jewish graduate. And so this man graduated from University of Montreal. He was top of his class and his name was Dr. Samuel Rabinovich. His parents moved from Palestine. His parents moved from Europe to Palestine at the turn of the 20th century to escape anti-Semitism in Europe. And then so his parents had all five of his siblings in Palestine, 
and they all immigrated to Montreal at a young age, and then all five siblings ended up attending medical school in Montreal. So now returning back to the 1934 hospital strike, a petition was eventually submitted by the other incoming Catholic residents demanding that Rabinovich should be fired. The hospital did not want to support what the interns demanded because Rabinovich was like, he signed a contract and he was bound to the hospital. So in response to the hospital's decision on June 14th, 1934, the Catholic interns all went on strike. Um, the hospital was extremely lacking staff and Rabinovich continued his duties as intern. So he was running from bed to bed, but patient care was compromised because there weren't enough staff. And it's important to note that the interns remained in the hospital during the entire duration of the strike. So they ate hospital food, they slept in the hospital beds, but they refused to serve the patients. On June 16th, the strike spread to 75 more interns at different French hospitals across Montreal. And then nurses in these hospitals also threatened to strike. Finally, on June 18th at 4 p.m., Rabinovich resigns. He gives three principal reasons for his resignation and he states them all in his resignation letter that was published in numerous newspapers, but I summarized them. So the first one was the direct insult which the Jewish race had just received. The second reason he gave was to resolve the suffering patients are facing due to the lack of proper care occasioned by the strike. And the last reason he gave was to help resolve the embarrassing position that the directors of the hospital were put in by standing with him. So this is a quote from Rabinovich's resignation letter that he wrote on June 18th. And I'm going to give you a couple seconds to read it and absorb it in thought. So here in the middle is Dr. Laporte, who was the superintendent of Hôpital Notre Dame. And it's his letter to Rabinovich after Rabinovich's resignation letter. Like after Rabinovich published his resignation letter, Laporte wrote him this letter. And in this letter, he accepts his resignation despite the board protesting against such action as his services were being retained under a bound contract. And then on the left, we see a photo of young Rabinovich. The strike really makes you question, how could these physicians provide adequate care to ethnic minorities if they so readily disregarded their Hippocratic oath to condemn their colleague for being Jewish? Within hours of Rabinovich's resignation, all the, Catholic, all the French Canadian Catholic interns were able to return to the hospital duties without any repercussions, and no laws were ever enforced to prevent future systemic racism from happening. Instead, as I mentioned before, UDM established a quota for Jewish medical students. Now, there was a lot of disagreement as to whether or not Rabinovich made the right decision. On one hand, he was doing what was best for the immediate care of his patients, but others believed, especially prominent leaders in the Jewish, Jewish community, believed that stepping down meant succumbing to anti-Semitism. Following his resignation, Hôpital Notre Dame helped Rabinovich find a new position as an intern in St. Louis, Missouri. In the years following the strike, it became very difficult for Jewish physicians to, who were Montreal medical school graduates to find internship positions in Montreal. So because of this, a lot of Montreal Jewish medical graduates went off to the States to find internship positions. In 1940, Rabinovich returns to Montreal and two of his children attended Montre McGill University's medical school. His son, Dr. Mark Rabinovich is a current cardiologist at the Montreal General Hospital. And his daughter, Dr. Marlene Rabinovich, is a professor in pediatric cardiology at Stanford and a research director for vascular diseases. And we're very lucky because they're both with us here today. Now going back to 1934, towards the end of the year is when the Jewish General Hospital was established in Montreal. The institution allowed Jewish doctors and other ethnic minorities to work in dignity and champion the first official non-discrimination policy in Canada. 
The idea to build a Jewish hospital was actually, actually first came about in 1928, but because of the 1929 stock market crash, there, wa there wasn't enough funds to get this project going. And it was only in 1934 that the Bronfman brothers assumed a leadership of a large fundraising campaign and the hospital was finally built. So I really do think that it's this 1934 hospital strike that catalyzed this project to get going. And we can see a picture of the Bronfman brothers below on the left. Rabinovich practiced medicine well into his 90s and in his old age, he was thought to be Canada's longest practicing physician. Sadly, in 2010, Dr. Rabinovich passed away at age 101. So although modern racism may have different targets, it's important to understand the history of other forms of prejudice in order to be able to better manage racism today. When I started writing this text, I was at a loss of words of how to properly summarize the strike. The strike was not a single incident, but a result of systemic racism. And systemic racism is an ever-changing concept, and it's extremely difficult to define and even more challenging to understand. So although the Montreal hospital strike remains one of the most iconic events in Montreal history, the lack of ongoing teaching of this event reminds us of our social tendency to selectively omit these unpleasant, unpleasant events from our current education. As a student who was born and raised in Montreal, I was never familiar that this event even occurred. And I thought maybe it was just me, but when I went around and I asked my family and friends, no one was familiar of this dramatic event. And even with regards to the Quebec history curriculum, where you start learning about Quebec history as early on as grade five until sec five, you learn about the same history every year, but the days of shame are completely omitted from our curriculum. In Canada, we often believe that our country is a model when it comes to inclusion, but we can't deny that systemic racism still exists. And even in medicine, especially among black communities, indigenous populations, the LGBTQ plus community and other ethnic minorities. If we want Montreal to be a place of equal opportunity and move towards a more inclusive future, it's vital that we understand where our city went wrong. So to conclude, the principle of do no harm begins by learning about our city's history of institutionalized racism. We have to acknowledge our mistakes in order to compel action and move forward. Thank you. And I guess now, if there's any questions or you, the question and answer period. Thank you, Lily, for the presentation. I'll be reading the questions. First of all, well done. Uh, it's great how you've woven a historical narrative into this uh, piece, and I'm sure Thank you. everyone appreciates it. So we have two questions I've received so far, and if people have more, we can entertain them. We have five minutes. So the first question I'll read for you, Lily, is that why do you think the board at Notre Dame Hospital hired Dr. Rabinovich originally if he was Jewish? And the second is, why would the board continue siding with him despite the pressure from the interns and the chaos of the situation ensued at the hospital? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. And I actually, I looked into that a couple of weeks ago. And what I found was that the Notre Dame hospital was actually, it was, a, it was one of the first Francophone lay hospitals in Quebec. So in an article that I read, they described it as a people's hospital and not simply just an extension of the church. So I think that, the administration of the hospital wanted to prove that they were standing their ground and that they were protecting their own values and trying to be trying to show that they were more liberal. So I think that they sided with Rabinovich not because they were pro anti Semitism or anti anti Semitism, but simply because they wanted to show that um, they were no longer part of the church and that they were no longer conforming to the religious values that they were subject to all these years. But obviously this is my interpretation of it. And there's a lot of conflicting information out there and it's so it's hard to piece together everything at face value, but that's what I think. And sorry, what was the first part of the question? The first part of the question was, why do you think the Notre Dame hospital originally hired him even though he was a Jew? 
Okay, so like I don't, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but the last position was filled by Robin. Rabinovich simply because they couldn't find another French Canadian intern to fill that position. And this was because a lot of the French Canadian intern medical graduates were going to the States to find internship positions because they were better paid in the States. So I think it was simply be they hired him because they lacked, they lacked enough people to fill the spots. And he was highly qualified, so, and he spoke French. Great. Speaking of speaking French, uh, so the second question I'm going to read for you, Lily. Are the letters to and from Dr. Rabinovich at the hospital, are the translations or, or the original? I'm going to also ask the third question because it's so it's similar. Which archive surprised you the most and why? Okay, I think I'm going to start with the second question because that one's easier for me. So I think that by far the archive that surprised me the most was the letter that was written by, um, I have it in my PowerPoint, but it was the letter, the letter that was written by Mackay to Sir Arthur Curry. And I think this was because, so I, I obviously know that racism exists and I know that people do think racist thoughts, but to actually concretely put these racist thoughts into a letter and to, to like establish them on a paper is a whole new dimension, in my opinion, of racism. And also like another thing that I wanted to say is that today when you think of education, you think of a safe space for learning that provides equal opportunities for everyone. But here, the people who are writing the communication of this letter is between, is between leaders of such a prominent edu like educational institution. So this letter really makes me question everything that I've ever learned. And in terms of the archives, so what I found is that the letters that were published by Rabinovich, from what I could find is I, I only found English letters and I'm, I don't think these were translations. I think the original letters written by Rabinovich were in English, but then all the communication that was given out by the administration of the hospital were all in French. And because I could speak French, I read the French or the original French archives rather than the translations. And most of the newspaper articles were also in French. Wonderful. So we are actually at 7.30. I do see another question from our next speaker, Brendan Ross. Uh, so actually, uh, there are two questions. I'm going to read both of them to you, Lily, and maybe you could make a concise summary so we could actually entertain both. So the first is that, uh, did Dr. Rabinovich write about this uh, later in his life? And the next one is from Dr. Mark Rabinovich, who asks, do you think that the Rabinovich affair has relevance in view of the current provincial government's policy regarding the restriction of religious apparel public institution? So I know they're big questions, but maybe a brief summary of both before we can proceed to the next speaker. Well, I think, wait, sorry, I'm just reading the first question. So what I, obviously Rabinovich still returned to Montreal after this whole hospital strike. And from the quotes that I found, he seemed to be very forgiving of the whole situation moving forward. And he continued practicing medicine in Montreal. So, and it's not exactly clear as to whether or not he ever practiced directly with the interns who he engaged in this strike with. But from what I could, tell at least was that he was very forgiving and also he raised his children in Montreal so he clearly had some ties to the city that he still valued and in terms of I think it's definitely relevant still to to, to today and so yesterday I watched a podcast by Edward Halperin and he compares he compares the uh the hospital strike because the original, the original chants that the interns were saying were, they were claiming that they did not want the Jews to replace a French Canadian intern. And in the podcast that I listened to yesterday, Halperin compares it to the recent incidents where there's protests stating that, white supremacy protests stating that the, the, like there's, there's still ongoing chants of 
Jews or other cultures not like they will not replace us. So I think it's simply in history, it's simply the nouns that are changing and not the verbs. So yes, I think it's still relevant to today. Thank you very much, Lily. Uh, so there are two more questions. What I'm going to ask you is that- A lot of questions. The response to them as we present the second speaker, just so we're in tune with the time, but please, there are some great questions coming your way. So I'm sure you're gonna do great. Okay, great. So now let's proceed on to if Dr. Yearly could share the slides uh, for the introduction of our next speaker. And again, well done, Lily. Uh, maybe if Lily could show, uh, stop sharing your screen and then uh, we will have that. Great. So I will introduce our second speaker. Uh, next, we have Brendan Ross, who is a third year medical student at Yale, healing from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, prior to coming to Montreal uh, for medical school, he spent three years studying, teaching, and interpreting in China, Taiwan. Uh, Brendan did his work as an inaugural recipient of the Molina Foundation Osler Library Medical Student Research Award. And the title of his talk is the, as you can see in the, in the slide, The Chinese Apotheosis of Dr. Norman Bethune, The Making of a Medical Folk Hero. So I'm now going to pass it on to Brendan to present our second presentation for the night. Brendan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Salman. Um, first off, I'm, as I get my screen ready to share here, I just wanna say, Lily, that was an incredible presentation. I had no idea about that history as well. Um, and I'm more new in Montreal as an international student, but knowing that Dr. Rabinovich also came to St. Louis for a short period of his life, I hope he enjoyed his year there. Um, I went to high school across the street from the Jewish hospital. So it sort of resonates with me and it was really um, cool to hear about how deep you researched this. So thank you. Okay, so one second, as I just pull up my slides. Okay. Okay, so can everyone see my slides okay? Okay, wonderful. Okay, so again, quickly, my name is Brendan. I'm a third year medical student at McGill. Um, my presentation today is about Norman Bethune, who is a physician that some of you in the audience might be familiar with. Uh, my advisor for this project, who I'd like to thank, is, is Dr. Del Maestro, uh, who has helped to put on this entire event and to fund this uh, Osler essay award. So I thank him, and he's gone through many revisions of this paper, so I hope he's still excited to hear about it. Um, and I also want to thank the Molino Foundation. So this, um, this paper was uh, researched in, with the support from um, this grant that was a new grant this year with the uh, Ozer Library, McGill University, and Dr. Molina, a doctor in the United States. And um, Dr. Haig Ural as well helped to coordinate this entire process. So I really appreciate all the help of the Ozer Library. It's been fun through the years of my medical schooling to continue to um, engage with the Ozer Library. Um, okay, so I'll just jump into my presentation since I realize uh, time is of the essence here. Um, okay, so my presentation is going to talk about mostly Bethune in China, but I, I think it's helpful to know, like, to talk a little bit about who Bethune is in the first place. So as an American coming to McGill, I did not know who Norman Bethune was, um, but I soon learned that a lot of my Canadian classmates didn't know either. There's, there's a statue of Dr. Bethune right outside of um, Guy Concordia Metro Station in Montreal. And that's one of the first times I ran into him. And then I ran into him in, again, when he had a new um, exhibition placed in, in the new MUHC hospital. Um, and once I actually traveled to China to do some medical research, I realized that every single person in China practically knows who Dr. Norman Bethune is. His name in Chinese is Bai Chou En. And if you ask anyone from your flight attendant on a plane, to your cab driver, to a doctor, to a little kid, they're all probably gonna know who Dr. Norman Bethune is. And that really stuck with me. So my presentation is gonna talk a little bit more about how did that happen? Okay, so before we get to Dr. Bethune's time in China, I think since there might be a bit of breadth of people's understanding of Dr. Bethune, I will give a little like context to his, uh, we'll call it his long march to radicalization. So Dr. Bethune was a, uh, was born in Gravenhurst, Ontario, uh, in Northern Ontario, and his father was a Presbyterian minister. So he traveled all over Northern Ontario, working in lumber camps and, and, and engaging with many different types of people in Canadian society, before ultimately making the surprising move to go to medical school at the University of Toronto, right before World War I. Uh, World War I hit and he went off to war. Uh, after returning to war, he finished medical school at University of Toronto, and then he went back to uh, Europe to finish his surgery training in Scotland. 
And he was a very peripatetic man. He kept moving around. So his next stop after uh, Scotland was to return and start practicing in Detroit in the 1920s. Um, sort of, and this, this is interesting to sort of think about my presentation in um, the context of Dr. Rabinovich is there are sort of contemporaries in time, maybe a little bit earlier, but similar tides of history are happening. So he maybe thought that there was um, better money to be made in Detroit, but he worked actually in an ind indigenous uh, a clinic for uh, poor and indigent people in Detroit and started to radicalize him. He started to see uh, inequality in healthcare. He also contracted tuberculosis while practicing. And so he had to pause his medical career. And at one point in 1926, he traveled to Saranac, New York and received tuberculosis treatment, which really radicalized him even more as he saw what the world looks like from the patient's perspective. Um, after curing his tuberculosis, he ret uh, returned, to uh, sorry, returned to Canada and moved to Montreal and worked at the Royal Victoria Hospital starting in 1928. Uh, it is here in Montreal when the Great Depression hits that he really starts to get involved in more pol like political movements. Uh, he also taught poor children arts on the side. He had a lot of interests, but one interest of his that kept growing was socialized medicine. So he was also an early proponent for a universal healthcare system that slowly took shape over the coming decades in Canada. Uh, at the time as well, a growing international socialist movement was happening around the world that also was happening in Canada. And so he joined the Communist Party of Canada quietly at first, but then he started giving speeches. And by 1936, he decided that he wanted to take his uh, action to the front lines and, and he went to join the efforts in the Spanish Civil War. So this picture here shows Dr. Bethune working at the front lines in the Spanish Civil War with the Republican side, the leftists, and he helped to introduce this new blood transfusion unit on the front. So here is a blood, a blood transfusion ambulance that he helped to enact. Okay. And so we're gonna jump now to his time in China because he, has, he, he moved around a lot, but this talk focuses China. So after briefly returning to Canada to give a tour and to, so to raise funds for the Spanish Civil War, he decided that he really wanted to go back to action. And so at the ripe age of 19, uh, 49, he, in 1938, he traveled to China and to the front lines of the Chinese War of Resistance against Japan uh, near Yan'an, China, which is, was where Mao's army and the People's Liberation Army had gathered at their headquarters to try to hide from the Japanese forces and to uh, conduct guerrilla combat. You can see here, if you remember the photo of, of Norman Bethune from here, he was this is him in medical school, rather debonair. And then 20 years later, 30 years later, he's, he's really gotten more rugged and rustic. And he, he really was working at the front lines of socialism at this point. Um, the conditions in China were rather tough. Another colleague of his, Dr. George Hatem, whose Chinese name was Ma Hai De, an American Lebanese doctor also working at the front in China, described a little bit of Bethune's typical work schedule. Uh, you can read it here, but I found one really amazing fact was that over 69 hours, he once handled 115 cases, cases, not counting first aid dressings. And Bethune was famous for taking on any task given to him. He would serve soup to uh, patients. He would operate often without any gloves or without any protective equipment. Um, and ultimately, this was his undoing. He developed sepsis after operating on someone without having gloves handy, and he died a few days later. Um, so I think this is a good point to pause and wonder. So here, here he is. Um, sorry, let's see if the okay slide's not moving. Okay. So whenever Dr. Bethune died, he very much could have been forgotten because he was left. He left no children. He was penniless and he died uh, in a cold field in rural China. But the Chinese Communist Party and the two head generals of the Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army decided to venerate Bethune. And so on the left here in this slide, it's unreadable because it's in Chinese, but these are two telegrams, international telegrams that were sent out from China by generals Juda and Peng Dehuai, the highest generals in China, uh, commemorating Bethune and all the service he gave to China at that time. They're written specifically to his families, thanking his families, but they were published in newspapers throughout China. And then a few months later, in 19, uh, later in 1939, um, Mao Zedong wrote an obituary of Norman Bethune that became probably the most central pillar of how Bethune continued to grow in fame in China. 
So I won't read the whole thing, but I'll read at least the first bit because I think it really evokes what Mao Zedong saw in Mort Northern Bethune and what he wanted to remember. So he says, what kind of spirit is this that makes a foreigner selflessly adopt the cause of the Chinese people's liberation as his own? It is a spirit of internationalism, the spirit of communism from which every Chinese communist must learn. So he really saw in Norman Bethune this figure that he could help, um, that he thought the Chinese people could learn from. Uh, this was also at a time when China was looking for support from international partners. So I think it also was politically done to try to curry support from Canadian and Chinese communists and to ha have their uh, for more doctors and more donations come to the front lines in China. All right. So this was in 1939. I would say for the next 20 years, Bethune didn't really grow in fame in China. His name was sort of lingering in the background of history. He wasn't really important. But another event happened that brought him back to the forefront. So in the late 1950s, after China's civil war had concluded and uh, Mao's side had won, uh, Mao started in conducting uh, economic plans. And a second five-year economic plan was known as the Great Leap Forward. And it was a total catastrophe. So due to economic restructuring, farmers leaving their own plots and trying to farm together, 15 to 55 million people died of starvation. And in this period, in the late 1950s, lots of other leaders in China, lots of other political leaders and generals started to doubt Mao and question his policies and question his authority. And so Mao grew very afraid. And so he decided to direct the country's attention back on a more glorious era, their original war of resistance with Japan. And so we can see in this next image, this is as the Cultural Revolution is rising in China, which many of you have probably heard of or read about. So there was many books that were promoted during this period, one including Mao's, Mao's Little Red Book. And this, this poster in the background is actually showing another book of the era called The Three Constantly Read Articles. And these three articles were you, ubiquitous. They were required reading by every single member of the People's Liberation Army. And one of those articles was the obituary of In Memory of Norman Bethune. So Bethune kind of found his return to life uh, 25 years, 30 years after his death uh, through this propaganda effort by Mao. Um, and so I think one, one comment on why there was an interesting foreword to an, uh, In Memory of Norman Bethune article in one of these Chinese newspapers that it sort of explains why was Bethune's essay included in these three pieces? They could have included lots of other pieces from the Civil War era or this Revolutionary War era. But one article mentioned Bethune's essay and Bethune's image provides us with a powerful weapon to eradicate self-interest and foster public interest. So at this time, Dr. Um, Dr. Bethune was a perfect example for Mao to bring up, to try to uh, bring people back to a sense of revolution, even though the revolution had already concluded and sort of carry on a perpetual revolution. And I'll now go into a lot of images. And I think these images in this artwork, which a lot of comes from the Oster Library itself, we have the originals in the Oster Library donated from China, which is exciting. So these images sort of show how uh, Mao used Bethune as this figure to enact constant revolution. So here in the background is Dr. Bethune in his surgical garb as this new generation of young Chinese people is carrying on the revolution during the Cultural Revolution. And below it says, we'll walk with the three constantly read articles into the future down the road. And Bethune was also used as an educational tool of, during the Cultural Revolution. And, he was a, used as a tool to teach children how to be a good communist, which I think is very interesting. So this picture here shows Bethune serving soup. There's a apocryphal story of him serving his portion to a young boy who was injured on the front lines. And there's in this picture book, there's also images of Bethune donating his own blood to soldiers who were wounded on the front with, of course, Mao looking on lovingly in the background. This picture shows Bethune marching forward after he may have already conducted sepsis and he's days away from dying, but it's this idea of this glory and converting everyone into these selfless supporters of the Communist Party. And here, I think this, the idea of this though is not necessarily to put all the honor on Bethune himself, but was also to reflect honor back on Mao Zedong. Uh, Mao had met with Dr. Bethune, so he really saw Bethune as someone who had already passed away and who can sort of mold in this image of the ideal uh, supporter. And so, of course, the images of Bethune also show Bethune writing in his journal about how wonderful it was meeting Mao. 
And all of this, I think, culminates in the mid 1960s and towards the end of the Cultural Revolution to Bethune becoming this folk hero throughout China, where every single young child in grades three or four had to re re uh, completely memorize the, the speech in memory of Norman Bethune. And I've met people who can still say it by heart. Um, so uh, I think, though, that when we think about this folk hero image, we have to remember that it's also part of the real person. I found this quote from Bethune in one of his own letters home a couple months before he died. He was planning on returning to Canada. He says he misses tremendously a comrade he could talk to, but of China, he says, they need me here. This is my region. I must come back. So I think in a way he really did connect with the Chinese people always while he was there, and that probably also fed into his myth. I also think that while perhaps the, okay, this image on the right is a propaganda poster of Bethune. It's very stylized. It's very the modern revolutionary idea. But this image on the left is actually a self-portrait of Norman Bethune that he painted while in Montreal. He was a great artist, in my opinion. And I think you can almost see in his, his artistic style that he, he stylized himself as a revolutionary, as this sort of this modern uh, physician who was trying to change the order of, of society. And I think this also led to this ultimate solidification of Bethune's myth after the Cultural Revolution even ended. So even after Mao died, this stamp from late 1970s shows Bethune on a statue in a stamp, which really shows the permanence of his image in China. He's not going anywhere fast. But then his image sort of returned back to Canada. Um, so this is, I'm running out of time, so I'll quickly run through a few slides. But this just shows the Canadian um, diploma, like foreign minister leaving the Forbidden City in China with a long-term wheat deal. And the Australian US foreign ministers are kind of grumpy because they hear the password sounds like Bethune. So Canada sort of resurrected Bethune and his image. They made a museum out of his home in Gravenhurst, Ontario. They built statues of him in Montreal to improve relations with China. Okay, in the nature of time, I'll quickly skip over this. But I think um, one final thing I'd like to mention is a Montreal-based writer who I've gotten to know well, who hopefully in the future will be able to talk at the Oser Library, um, Mr. Shui Yiwei. He grew up uh, during this period and he grew up memorizing uh, the Bethune um, obituary. And he wrote a book called Dr. Bethune's Children, which he considers himself. And so for him, this is more than just a factoid of history. This is part of his life. This is a figure he lo looked up to as a little kid. And he describes how these figures like Bethune nourished our lives and created the foundations of our thought. So I think it really shows the importance of Bethune to a generation of Chinese. Um, and of course, like I think I opened it up to us as a group as, as there's a little time for questions, but what can Bethune's story help us to understand about China and whom we decide to remember? I think one thing I'd like to say is that I think Bethune, the story can sometimes seem like it's a story of this Canadian doctor, this white man who went to China, but I really think of the story of Bethune as a Chinese story. They really made this their own story, and it was really a story of Mao and his supporters finding something in this, this doctor who came to China and then creating this whole myth out of him. And I will have one final slide, which is, is this relevant for us today? I just opened the New York Times this morning. This is from this morning's New York Times. And there is this article talking about how in China, they're making it a crime to mock heroes. So I just say to you all, I hope I didn't mock Norman Bethune because if I were to to China, I don't know if that will be a problem. But it's really interesting to me that this feels really relevant today. This, the, 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 the heroes are talking about mocking are these very people like Norman Bethune. So I think this speaks to a little bit of China's view of history and their view of politics and how it, it is uh, quite different from our own. So thank you very much. And I hope there's a little time for questions. And I really appreciate Salman and Dr. Del Maestro, Dr. Hei Yurl, and everyone for putting this on. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brendan. Congratulations. A very, very interesting talk, saturated with information, the zeitgeist of China. I mean, I have questions, but I can't ask. So I'll go with the order the questions are received. The first question that I'm going to begin this from is, can we trust that Mao actually wrote what is attributed to uh, Norman Bethune? What are your comments about that? That is a very, very good question. The answer is, a short answer is no, we cannot. Although the long answer is Mao was in his time, a relatively prolific writer, he, his, his speeches and his writings are often, and, and it's the question of course is how much of it is actually written by him, but in terms of Chinese historiography, it's very, very difficult to question what is written by Mao. So there's not a lot of sort of deep research into whether this was actually been written by Mao or not. My guess would be that the obituary itself was probably written by Mao. I think there's other articles at the time that sort of 
Mao, Mao really wanted, um, he, he was disgruntled at the time in Yan'an with other comrades who were maybe less selfless than Bethune. So people, some, there was other writings at the time talking about how Mao used Bethune as the example at the boardroom meetings to talk about how we need to be better communists. So I think there's a chance that at least the idea of the article, whether it was drafted by someone else, came from Mao himself. Thank you, Brendan. The second question is a little bit longer. It's also in the chat. So if you'd like to also consult it as I read it for you, I'll begin. It's from Noor. So the question reads, what is your hypothesis regarding the lack of recognition that Dr. Bethune has in Quebec compared to China? Second part, do you think a similar lack of recognition would occur had he done the work today in Quebec, given that we are more actively involved in transcultural domains medicine? Yeah, that's a great point. I think um, to speak to that, for the first point, I think there was an era in Montreal where some people who maybe had the ability to promote McGill, uh, to promote Bethune within McGill, for example, didn't really appreciate Bethune at the time. So a doctor, this I won't read this whole thing, but uh, basically this is a large, a long quote from a doctor at uh, the Royal Victoria in 1973, where they were having a, a meeting asking, do we put up a little plaque of Bethune on some hallway? Uh, is that going to, is that going to be enough? And this doctor was like, well, I, he was, you know, not the best surgeon. We should, maybe we can put a little plaque here. But I think that he, he was a really larger than life figure. But I think back in Montreal, he, um, well, I can leave it on that slide. It's okay. But um, so I think in that sense, he, his name really carried weight in China. So since he was part of the Chinese Civil War and Chinese War of Resistance, I think the Chinese people have a sort of a ownership to him that Canadians maybe do not. But I do think that now that we're in this era of more transculturalism, we actually do see um, today at McGill, there's a second Norman Bethune, who's fortunately a Chinese Canadian physician. So um, a classmate of mine's uncle is the surgeon, um, Dr. Shim Tim, who you may, may be familiar with, who's a surgeon who goes to China every year. And he also does some, some work in China. I also think that the third point is it's a little difficult today because going to China for service isn't necessary anymore necessarily because China is also going to other parts of the developing world to provide aid, which of course is its own contentious subject. But I think um, the world has definitely changed from whenever Norma Bethune went to China. So I think it's hard to say if a doctor went to China today, I don't think they would necessarily receive the same recognition as they did when he went. Yeah. Thank you for thoroughly addressing the question. So we have more of a comment, I think, in the next one, and it reads, when I attended McGill Medical School 1974 to 1978, we had a Norman Bethune Society. Does that group still exist? I'm not sure if you know, Brendan. Uh, That's a great point. I never have heard of this before, and I wish I had. Yeah. Um, well, maybe the, the medical students on this call can start it if we want. No, I'm kidding. But we'll, well, it's, I would say it's a society of one for me for now, but um, uh, it's really cool to hear. I'd love to hear more about uh, this Norman Bethune Society and what, what went on with it in the, the 1970s. That sounds very interesting. Great. I'll join too. Uh, Maya, I'll just just make a comment here. If there's a, there's going to be a Norman Bethune uh, Society, I think I'll join too. So <laughs> we can start with two people and see where it goes from there. That'd be wonderful, Dr. Del Maestro. Thank you. I'd be happy to join too. Okay, great. I mean, a very brief question. I don't see any more questions in the chat. I have a question for you. How do you think that, uh, you know, I mean, this is for the speakers that spoke today, you know, having a history, historiographic background about this, you know, living in China and also having that, how do you think that enriches your medical studies? Not that it has to, but in what ways do you think having that knowledge and expertise? Yeah, I think for, for both, I imagine, I was even thinking about this through Lily's talk. I think when we contextualize what we're doing as medical students or physicians in the course of history, because right now we're living in an era, right? We're living in the COVID era. And I think we don't know what history is going to be written about this era, but sometimes it's, it's medical school is so busy, it's easy to go through the motions. But then you look at a doctor like Dr. Rabinovich, especially who changed so much of the of society in Montreal at the time and tried to fight against racism. And it, it reminds me that uh, there are still things to work toward today. And, uh, and we can think about, the walls, be, uh, things beyond the walls of the hospital. I think oftentimes it's easy as a medical student to be confined to our lectures and exams and then work in the hospital. But really being a doctor should be about engaging with the world, I think. So that's my short answer. Beautiful answer, great. Uh, last one uh, from Dr. Molina actually. Uh, John Bethune from Nova Scotia was a chairman of the medicine at University of Southern California when I was a student. I wonder if he was somehow related. Do you know, Brendan? That's a good question. I don't know of any physician Bethune's related. There's definitely some cousins. There's, he has a lot of 
cousin or you know nieces and nephews down different lines. Uh, there's a lot of Bethunes in Canada who who have some connection to Norman Bethune. Um, so I will have to dig through the the family tree a little bit deeper to know about that. But yeah. Well, thank you very much, Britton, for that very engaging introduction, and uh, also Lily, our medical students for the symposium. So I'm going to uh, ask uh, Dr. Ural to maybe share the, the next slide uh, as part of our program, and I will introduce our final speaker for this evening. Uh, Professor Faith Wallace of the Department of History and Classical Studies and Department of Social Studies of Medicine will provide a commentary upon the two essays as well as an insider and scholar's perspective on the Osler Library of the History of Medicine in her talk, Osler, the Student. Just to add, earlier in her career, Professor Wallace held the position of the Osler Librarian and has an intimate and unrivaled knowledge of the collections. <laughs> I can confirm that because she gave us a lecture on uh, William Harvey and Block C. It was wonderful. So the floor is yours. Professor. Okay. All right, let me share my screen with you. Okay, um, good. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Brendan, for two extraordinary talks, which um, actually interdigitated with each other beautifully because um, they both touched upon how medicine gets politicized. And maybe that's a very ancient story that goes back quite a long way. But certainly in the two 20th century stories that you told about Norman Bethune and about Dr. Rabinovich, we can see um, how medicine itself, the care of patients, can be um, captured by political forces for good and for ill, um, and um, uh, essentially um, uh, engaged in or, or, or locked into, into political battles. They were both talks about, about politics, about perception, about propaganda. And in a way, the elephant in the room was patient care. Um, as Lily pointed out, Dr. Rabinovich, uh, his, uh, his, one of his major reasons for finally tendering his resignation is that he felt it was in the best interests of the patients in the hospital uh, in which he had been engaged, uh, that the strike come to an end and that they get the care that they deserved. But I'd also like to point out one of the slides that Lily showed en filigrane was a cartoon, an anti-Semitic cartoon of an obviously Jewish doctor uh, approaching the bed of a female patient. And this was part of the anti-Semitic rhetoric of uh, the beginning of the 21st century, that uh, Jewish doctors were predatory on uh, non-Jewish uh, patients, particularly dangerous around female patients, that their, their capacity as caregivers was called into question, that they were demonized, if you will. Now, in a sense, the opposite happens with Norman Bethune. He's not demonized, he's heroized. Um, and his uh, extraordinary work as a frontline healthcare worker in a wartime situation um, becomes the subject of almost a hagiography in China. So that, you know, there's all kinds of stories about how he gives his food away and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, that, that in a sense almost um, occludes the real, the real hard work that he put in, in the cause in which he believed. So um, I think that what I'm going to take away from both of these, both of these wonderful talks, is uh, a sense of how powerful medicine is, as a as a cultural force in our world, and how all sides of different political battles want to capture that power, and to make it work on behalf of their political agendas whether for good or for ill. And I think it's something that young doctors in particular have to bear in mind. In a way, they're almost like, in a sense, priests, you know, the, where religious messages can get co-opted uh, and the real work of religion get lost. So I think that medical students as well should be aware of just how powerful the act of healing is, how, uh, how, just how powerful the doctor is as a symbol uh, and how um, 
easy it is or how common it is for healthcare as an act and the doctor as a human being to be um, caught up and um, appropriated, if you will, into, into, into different uh, political, political discourses. So there is lots of messages for the 21st century, many of which Lily uh, in particular uh, underscored, uh, but you know, that was the, the one that I wanted to bring up as well too. Okay, well, since now I have the floor, I'm gonna do something completely different. Um, I'm going to talk about um, Osler, the student. When William Osler died in January 1919, he was the most famous physician in the English speaking world. Talk about heroes. He was admired as an excellent researcher, a virtuoso diagnostician, a, a model clinician, the author of a really uh, successful and influential textbook, The Principles and Practice of Medicine an eloquent spokesman for both the old humanities and the new science in their relation to medicine. Perhaps though in the long view of history, Osler's most important contribution to his profession was without doubt the changes that he helped to bring about in the way medical students were trained. When Osler went from McGill to the United States in 1884, most American medical schools were proprietary colleges that had no hospital connections, no laboratories and no admission requirements. When Osler left for England in 1905, he and the universities with which he had been associated, McGill here in Montreal, Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, had ignited an educational revolution, one that would be legitimized in the 1911 Flexner Report. This revolution saw the replacement of proprietary schools with university medical faculties offering a graded curriculum of up-to-date scientific education with clinical training in a hospital setting. Now, all of these institutional and curricular innovations have been highly documented elsewhere. What I'm going to talk about tonight is Osler's teaching ethic, which is actually his learning ethic. Even in the context of the progressive institutions in which he taught, Osler was a really unconventional teacher. Um, he disliked lectures. He preferred in both basic science and clinical teaching to have his students learn by doing with their teacher at their side as a kind of senior colleague. In the laboratory, in the dissecting room at the bedside, Osler taught by putting himself in the position of the student. He even used his own mistakes as instructional material to impress the point that there's no lesson that sinks in more impressively than the lesson that you learned by making a mistake. The student's reaction to this new approach to teaching was, after some initial shock, um, great enthusiasm. But there's more to this than just Osler's personal charisma. Osler taught the way he did because he had distinct ideas of what it meant to be a student. He believed that the student was not the raw material of medical education, but its final product. That becoming a student and a student for life was in fact what medical education was all about. For Osler, the term student didn't connote some kind of cognitive blank screen onto which the teacher would inscribe facts uh, and truths. On the contrary, becoming a student was an active, purposeful process with specific requirements and specific stages. In Osler's lexicon, students are human beings who can't help but ask questions and who will not rest content until they know the answer and who pursue answers with perseverance and humility. The student's salient characteristics in Osler's words are an absorbing desire to know the truth and an unwavering steadfastness in its pursuit. The purpose of medical education is to foster, train, and internalize this questioning faculty, as well as to put into the student's hands the, the tools that he needs in order to find the answers. Now, this kind of education can only be carried out by teachers who are themselves perpetual students. Good practitioners and good tech teachers alike must cultivate what sort of popularized American Zen teaching calls beginner's mind and learn to resist the deadly enemy of beginner's mind, which is routine. The grind of busy practice leaves no time or relish for asking questions or investigating problems. 
The grind of a heavy teaching load for a professor produces the same results. And the most sinister thing about routine from Osler's perspective is that the practitioners or the teachers who fall victim to its spell may not even be aware of their creeping intellectual sclerosis. For they'll seem in their own eyes and in the eyes of others to be very successful in what they're doing. And if the medical students' teachers are routinists themselves, it's not difficult to imagine why the students become routinist practitioners. Now, both of these specimens, the routinist professor and the routinist practitioner, have essentially forgotten what it means to be a student, if they ever knew. To immunize against routine, Osler recommended four intellectual and I would say moral habits. First, the art of detachment, by which oddly enough, Osler means the self-discipline required to resist the insidious drift into routine. Secondly, the virtue of method, which is essentially habits, good habits, especially intellectual habits that will enable the busy physician to seize on important questions as they arise in practice and to work uh, in a systematic and scientific way towards solving them. The quality of thoroughness is commitment to the exact and exhaustive principles and method of science. And last but not least, the grace of humility. Humility to recognize that truth is really hard to attain, that mistakes have to be acknowledged, they have to be regretted, and above all, they have to be learned from. For Osler, the whole purpose of medical education was to inculcate these habits. And that's what defines what a student is for him. To ensure that they survive after graduating from medical school, he prescribed three things, a notebook, a library, and what he called a quinquennial brain dusting, which is essentially a study leave or a sabbatical leave every five years. The notebook is a reminder to observe and to ask questions as they occur to you. Don't let the opportunity fly by. The library is the means for keeping current with the latest developments. We might say the library is electronic now, but it's, it serves the same purpose. And the brain dusting is the antidote to complacency. The aim of all three is to keep the science and medicine and to keep the student in the practitioner. Now, Ulster practiced what he preached. Preached. He always had a, he was a self-confessed perpetual student throughout his life. He always had a notebook in his vest pocket. We have several of them in the Oster Library. He devoured books and journals. He regularly traveled abroad. The result was a steady stream of publications that spoke eloquently of his scientific method, his thoroughness, his discipline. Uh, but if students are made and not born, well, how did Osler himself become a student? Well, I can see from the outset that he wasn't a born student. Quite the contrary, his academic career could not have been begun less auspiciously. To put it plainly, young William Osler was a juvenile delinquent. He was expelled from his first school in Dundas, Ontario, after a series of pranks, which included locking a flock of geese into the schoolroom overnight and unscrewing all the benches and desks and hiding them in the attic. Thereafter, Osler was packed off to boarding school in Barrie, Ontario where he proceeded to organize a trio of troublemakers who were baptized Barry's bad boys. Osler's parents pulled him out of the Barry school and probably just in the nick of time. Their third attempt at schooling young Willie was to send him to Trinity College School in Western Ontario, then under the direction of its founder, an Anglican clergyman of marked high church sympathies named W.A. Johnson. Now, Father Johnson was the warden or the director of Trinity College School, but all of the formal teaching was actually done by a headmaster who was not only rather humor humorless, but whose unimaginative methods of drilling Greek and Latin into his pupils, not to mention his devotion to caning them, killed a lot of their joy in learning. Father Johnson, however, took over on the weekends, and that was when the fun began, because Father Johnson was a keen amateur naturalist. He took the boys out on specimen hunting field trips, and in the evening, he read the classics of English literature to them in front of the fire. The impact of Johnson's unconventional and informal style 
on Osler was absolutely electric. What Johnson was doing was not supposed to be teaching at all, but it was Osler's first exposure to what he later came to define as real teaching. Teaching about the real world, teaching by doing, teaching by example, rather than coercion. Now, though Osler ended up doing very well in all of his formal subjects, it's what he learned at the side of Father Johnson that actually determined his life course. He became Johnson's unofficial scientific assistant, helping him collect and prepare specimens for microscopic study and sharing his vast enthusiasm for all branches of biology. He also made the acquaintance of one of Johnson's naturalist friends, an equally eccentric physician and professor of natural theology at Trinity College, Toronto, named James Bovell. When Osler went to Trinity College initially to study for the Anglican priesthood, he spent most of his time hanging around Bovell's house and helping him with his scientific collections. At the beginning of his second year, Osler switched to the medical school. Now, classmates of Osler's at the Toronto Medical School remarked that Osler was a very hardworking, conscientious student, but typically it was not the lecture hall that attracted him. Instead, Osler spent endless hours in the dissecting room or with Dr. Bovell's microscope. He drank in all the medicine he could, but most of it was absorbed through self-teaching, learning by doing. Part of this learning by doing involved serving as Bovell's unofficial assistant on his house calls and consultations and exploring his huge library. He also attended Bovell's lectures, which were eccentric to say the least. Bovell paid almost no attention to the published syllabus of classes. He lectured on whatever interested him at the moment. And at the moment when Osler was a student, what interested Bovell was the controversy over Charles Darwin and his theories of evolution. Bovell's offbeat style was a reflection of his openness to what was new and exciting in the scientific world. Like Father Johnson's enthusiastically, enthusiastically direct hands-on approach, it imprinted on Osler's mind an exemplar of what it meant to be a student for life. Now, at the end of Osler's second year at Toronto, Bovell decided to move back to his native West Indies, and Osler, on his mentor's advice, elected to transfer to McGill. The didactic lectures at McGill bored him just as much as did the lectures at Toronto. But fortunately for Osler, the clinical teaching on the wards, the Montreal General Hospital was managed rather differently. The instructor was Dr. Palmer Howard, who later became Dean of the Faculty of Medicine. Howard was widely admired for his, wide, for his, his, his deep knowledge, as well as his gentlemanly style. But what attracted Osler was the fact that Howard was a student as well as a teacher. Indeed, he was a great teacher in Osler's eyes because he was a student. Here's what Osler said about him. In my early days, I came under the influence of an ideal student hyphen teacher, the late Palmer Howard of Montreal. With him, the study and teaching of medicine were an absorbing passion, the ardor of which neither the incessant or ever increasing demands upon his time nor the growing years could quench. When first as a senior student, I came into contact with him in the summer of 1871, the problem of tuberculosis was under discussion. Every lung lesion in the Montreal General Hospital had to be shown to him. And I got my firsthand introduction to Lenec, to Graves and to Stokes and became familiar with their works. An ideal teacher, because a student, ever alert to the new problems, an indomitable ener energy enabled him in the midst of an exacting practice to maintain an ardent enthusiasm, still to keep bright the fires of his, that had lighted in his youth. Since those days, I've seen many teachers and have had many colleagues, but I've never known one in whom was more happily combined the stern sense of duty with the mental freshness of youth. Now it's worth pausing here to reflect on a few details of this portrait. Howard was an ideal student hyphen teacher, an ideal teacher because a student, a man for whom study and teaching were two sides of the same coin, a man at once mature and endued with the mental freshness of youth. Freshness denotes, uh, can be translated as boundless curiosity about medicine, combined with discipline to formulate questions properly and focused hard work to look for the answers. Palmer Howard was always a dignified man, but he was totally without pomposity. He delivered didactic lectures to his students and Osler significantly actually took copious notes of Palmer Howard's lectures, but he also involved them in his own research projects. And he taught things in the right order 
from firsthand experience to books and not vice versa. It was in order to solve the problems presented by the lung lesions that Howard sent Osler to read Lenach and Stokes and all the others. Howard's kind of teaching was exciting, engaging, and relevant, like the teaching of Johnson and Bovell, but much more coherent and scientific and, and disciplined. Now, when Osler became lecturer in and then professor of the Institutes of Medicine at McGill and started his own teaching career, he adopted almost instinctively the Johnson, Bovell, Howard approach to teaching. I say almost instinctively because he did have to give lectures and at the outset, he actually wrote out his lectures in longhand and read from a script. But very soon, however, however, he abandoned this in favor of a less formal medium of cards, you know, with a few cue words written on them. He would have loved PowerPoint. Um, and uh, he, you know, he cast aside this sort of magisterial style, which didn't really uh, suit him. He simultaneously began to teach the way physiology, pathology, and histology were taught at McGill. He purchased microscopes for his students and he paid for them by taking a salaried post as physician in the smallpox wards at the Montreal General Hospital. He finagled an unpaid appointment as pathologist at the MGH so that he could continue to teach himself morbid anatomy. And he employed his students as his assistants so that they could learn along with him. His pathology classes were about as far removed from didactic lectures as uh, what well, he could get them. One student from his Montreal days recalls the following. He said, Osler's method was to select three or four of his class to perform the autopsies during the week at the MGH. From these autopsies, a certain number of specimens were selected for a Saturday clinic. Before the class met, the specimens were all arranged on separate trays, carefully labeled. Each specimen in turn was carefully discussed and all the important points clearly indicated. At the close of each case, questions were called for and answered, the whole being very informal and conversational. The facts elicited in the autopsies were carefully correlated with the clinical histories and notes of the cases as taken on the wards. In order that his teaching should be of greatest value to those in attendance, he furnished each one with a written description of each specimen and with an epitome of the remarks which he'd prepared. There were always four pages and at times eight pages of large letter size written by himself and copied by means of a copying machine. There were from 30 to 40 copies required every Saturday. So the demand such a task made upon his time must have been heavy. Now, you know, practical demonstrations and handouts are so commonplace in today's classroom, but these techniques were highly unusual in the 19th century. In his convocation address of 1875, at the very outset of his McGill career, Osler took a somewhat unusual rhetorical tack. Instead of emphasizing how well prepared the students were for life, he stressed that the training of the that the graduates had just received was incredibly incomplete. For this reason, they had to become perpetual students because medical knowledge was always growing. He offered what would become his standard advice, take notes, keep up with the literature, join a medical society, travel. Being a student was the end and not just the means. When Osler went to the University of Pennsylvania in 1884, it was the premier medical center in the United States, but it was totally unprepared for the style of its new professor of medicine. Osler was accustomed to bedside teaching in the hospital wards, something comparatively undeveloped in Philadelphia. Dr. William Pepper, who was Osler's distinguished senior opposite number, rarely appeared in the hospital at all, except to give his lectures. And these lectures were very ceremonious affairs. Pepper was conveyed to the hospital in his carriage. He was dressed in a frock coat and a top hat and gloves. And his lectures were very polished and brilliant declamations. Osler took the streetcar to work, brought his own bag lunch and insisted on illustrating disease with actual examples from the hospital wards. Moreover, Philadelphia clinical teachers in Osler's days were not normally expected to be interested or involved in research. But within a month of his arrival, Oster had improvised a small clinical laboratory under a part of the hospital's amphitheater where Pepper held forth. After the initial sort of shock and dismay had worn off, he rapidly began to attract a large and enthusiastic group of students for whom this informal practical teaching style was a breath of fresh air. The most telling manner in which Osler differed from his older colleagues in Philadelphia was his disarming way of using his own diagnostic mistakes 
for teaching purposes. As was his wound, Oster spent countless hours working at autopsies in the dead house at Blockley, which is attached to the, the Philadelphia Hospital. One of his interns, Dr. William T. Sharpless, wrote the following recollection. Sharpless says, I have the most distinct recollections of the Sundays when he came early in the morning and spent the whole day doing necropsies, which we saved for him so far as it was possible to do so. I've known him to begin at eight in the morning and continue with this work until evening. He would hunt for hours to find the small artery concerned in a pulmonary hemorrhage or the still smaller one whose rupture produced a hemiplegia. If he found something interesting, he would send out the runner to get all the boys and show what a wonderful thing he'd found and how beautiful and instructive it was. Once in a ward class, there was a big man whom he demonstrated as showing all the classical symptoms of Krupus pneumonia. The man came to autopsy later. He had no pneumonia, but he had a chest full of fluid. Dr. Osler seemed delighted. He sent especially for the, all those on his ward classes, showed them what a big mistake he had made, how it might have been avoided, and how careful they should be not to repeat it. In 30 years of medical practice since that time, whenever I've been called upon to decide between these two conditions, I remember that case. I'm sure that it had the same effect on other members of the class that it had on me and was certainly the right sort of medical teaching. Now, one cannot help but contrast this transparent honesty with the style of Dr. William Pepper, who was known to lecture brilliantly on Addison's disease using a patient with ordinary jaundice for the purpose of the clinic and knowing full well that it was a deception. Later at Johns Hopkins, Oster inaugurated what he called observation clinics held three times a week. The clinics took place in an unpretentious room near the dispensary, furnished with a table and a half dozen simple chairs. A few patients were selected by the assistants for the morning's ambulatory clinic and brought into the room. Not only had the students never seen the patient before, but neither had Osler. Teacher and student together conducted the physical exam and discussed the various diagnostic options. Students were dispatched to the library to look up articles of relevance, and others were detailed to report on their researches at the next clinic. One of the most striking ways in which Osler formed his students to be lifetime students was by involving them in the research process and encouraging them to publish their findings in medical journals even before they graduated. This is illustrated by a research project for which Osler deliberately recruited his female students. Neither McGill nor Pennsylvania admitted women students. Though I'd point out that when Osler taught at McGill and was also pathologist at the MGH, he often delegated the writing up of the path reports to students. And in one case, the report is actually signed by a woman. I don't know how she got in there, but she did. When Osler arrived in Baltimore, the Johns Hopkins Hospital was up and running, but the medical school was stalled for lack of money. The crisis was resolved by what could be called the aggressive philanthropy of Mary Garrett who offered to bail out the insolvent medical school if they would admit women as well as men. The proposal was a controversial one, but it was eventually accepted and Osler strongly supported the initiative. He penned an important letter with uh, 11 other people. It was gender parity, six men, six women uh, in, uh, in the Century Magazine saying that, <clears throat> you know, whatever your views on female doctors are, there's no question that women have a right to a medical education, but he did more. In 1901, Osler gathered a group of women students to carry out a research project. Many sufferers from TB, from tuberculosis in Baltimore, were too poor to afford a physician, so they came to the Johns Hopkins Hospital out outpatient dispensary. In the wake of Koch's discovery of the bacillus, which causes TB, Osler had become an apostle of what we would now call test and trace. Were these dispensary patients just the symptomatic tip of the iceberg? Were there others that they were living with at home who were exposed, who had become infected, who needed to be, who needed care? So Osa recruited Elizabeth Blauvelt and three other women medical students at Johns Hopkins, Adelaide Dutcher, Blance, Ep Blance Epner, and Esther Rosencrantz to provide follow-up care for dispensary patients via home visits. The program had several related purposes, to check the patient's health status, to teach them about the disease and how to avoid spreading it, and to gather information about the patient's living conditions 
and how these conditions might encourage and spread the disease and to encourage others who lived with them to come in for testing. In the summer of 1901, Elizabeth Blauvelt prepared a summary of the data she had collected on 116 tuberculous patients between January and June of that year. Blauvelt and her colleagues also recorded how many, how many different places the patient had lived in since his or her TB diagnosis. This data would provide support for what was called the house infection concept, first introduced by the Philadelphia tuberculosis expert, Lawrence Flick in 1888. Flick's research had shown that the TB bacillus could persist in rooms even after the TB patients had moved out. And since most landlords didn't disinfect apartments between tenants, the next apartment could, the next occupant could, next tenant could contract the disease as well too. Flick recommended the cities require physicians to register all TB cases and arrange to have TB patient residences disinfected by either the landlords or city health departments. And Osler wanted to carry this battle into Baltimore armed with his students' data. He also encouraged these students to publish even when they were still students. Adelaide Dutcher uh, uh, published, for example, in the Philadelphia Medical Journal in a special number on tuberculosis. Now it's noticeable that at least two and probably three of these women students were Jewish. Um, and Osler was um, absolutely immune to anti-Semitism. As to anti-Black racism, well, I would argue that he was as well too. When the expansion of the wards for Black patients on John, in Johns Hopkins Hospital was being discussed and the issue of Black nurses was being debated, Osler actually led the charge by going on the record saying he'd be very happy to have a Black intern, thank you. Um, now, as I've written about elsewhere, Osler's views on race in the abstract were pretty much those of his age. And we've heard about those from Lily and they can sound ugly to our ears and rightly so. But when it came to the real people he lived and worked among, he was, particularly when you compare him to the standards of his day, what might also, almost in modern terminology be called an ally. It's interesting to note that Oster himself was often mistaken for a foreigner. People who didn't know him when they met him for the first time thought he was Italian or a Spaniard, or perhaps even from India. He was a fairly short man. He had black hair and black eyes and a rather dark complexion. Now, whether this gave Osler a certain empathy for the racialized is hard to say, but it's clearly on record how much he supported women. Maud Abbott here at McGill, Florence Sabin and Dorothy Reed at Johns Hopkins. To Osler, they were all medical students and hence fellow students with him. His Oxford students, oops, no, his, his Oxford students who are accustomed to the formal style of British professors recall with awe how Osler would circulate amongst the candidates as they wrote up their clinical reports and pass a few comments on the case as if from colleague to colleague. It was in fact the shared ethos of being a student for life that was the foundation of the medical profession. As he remarked, when a simple earnest spirit animates a college, there's no appreciable interval between the teacher and the taught. Both are in the same class, the one a little more advanced than the other. So animated the student feels that he has joined a family whose honor is his honor, whose welfare is his own, and whose interest should be his first consideration. But for Osler itself, it was always deeply personal and very sincere, a source of creative energy, but also a fundamental identity. As he said to the students at the Albany Medical College in 1899, it's a good many years since I sat on the benches, but I'm happy to say that I'm still a medical student. I still feel that I have so much to learn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wallace, for this very insightful, very interesting uh, grand finale, really enjoyable. I'm sure all our presenters also enjoyed it. Uh, so we actually are doing okay with time. We have five minutes for Q&As. Uh, I have not received any questions in private, so uh, I guess we'll be waiting for that to come. Um, oh, 
I put everybody to I put everybody to sleep, right? <laughs> I have a question to begin with, actually. Maybe we can maybe start with that. So one of the one of the topics that you talked about are, are this sort of topic about books and learning and the idea that one would sort of transcend beyond what discipline they're in. If we look today, for example, where the rate of every discipline is almost doubling every six years. What would you suggest to someone who's interested, let's say a medical student who's interested in learning about other areas, but is somewhat hesitant about how that would affect their area of specialization later on? What are your comments based on the topic uh, that you talk, talked about? I, I, I'm, I'm, I am really not sure that I, um, I can, because I'm not a physician myself. Um, I'm well aware that in my own field of medical history, the uh, uh, um, the amount that I have to read uh, seems to uh, quadruple uh, with every passing years, passing year. Um, if you can take a study break, can you take a sabbatical? Can you even take a mini sabbatical? Uh, you know, a couple of months in which you can unhook yourself from your routine, step back. Um, and, uh, um, and, and just, you know, almost for the fun of it, look into something different. Maybe also try to think sort of laterally from what you do. Um, that, uh, uh, you know, if you're a respiratory uh, physician, um, thinking about how um, tuberculosis is still highly prevalent in, um, in, in many places in the world, um, why is this disease continued after all the advances that have been made in the past uh, several hundred years in terms of diagnosing and, and, and treating it? Why is it still um, on the rise? You know, in other words, engage yourself in some kind of um, research project that builds on your medical expertise, but takes you into the world of, of um, of activism, maybe, or uh, uh, you know, at least of of, um, of social engagement, um, and I think that both of our student presenters kind of epitomized what that that could be. I don't know how possible it is for the the busy young medical practitioner just launching out into his career to uh, to take a mini sabbatical, but. Um, you know, maybe when you're a bit established and you start to feel that you're getting a little bit in a rut, a rut is what Oster called uh, uh, the routine, right? That it's it's time to uproot yourself, go somewhere else, you know, uh, and or you know, just just be in another place and see how things are done there. Okay. Oh, gee, all of these wonderful bouquets being tossed at me in the in the in the in the chat. Does anybody? Have any questions? <laughs> Brendan has a question. Brendan, would you like to unmute, or uh, would you like me to read it for you? Maybe you can. I can, I can say it briefly, so it's easier than finding it in the chat. But I was just curious. Um, I know do, uh, Dr. Osler was such a prolific reader, and and yeah. your um, research of him. Is there a certain poet, poem, or poet or writer that he seems mm -hmm. to constantly go back to? Yes. Literary, yeah. Yes, 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 and that is somebody you've probably never heard of. Thomas Brown. Oh yeah, and the, the, that famous medical text that he likes. Called, to do. It's called, the title of his book, which was written in English, it was written in the middle of the 17th century, Religio Medici, which means the, a doctor's devotion. Mm -hmm. the, the word religio in Latin doesn't mean religion, it means devotion. Uh, Thomas Brown lived at a time which is very much like ours, a time of intense polarization in England, it was a time of the English Civil War between Parliament and the King, a time of intense religious polarization between Puritans and, uh, and Anglicans. Um, he lived through a period of unprecedented uh, uh, violence and, uh, what can I say, uh, um, lack of toler intolerance. Religio Medici is uh, not only a reflection on being a doctor, but also a, a wonderful text about, about, um, about tolerance and humanity and above all, how the doctors care for the human person pushes other considerations like religion 
uh, or politics. Uh, it, it puts them in their place as being minor accidents of, of uh, the times we live in. Um, and it's really the person who, who counts. Um, I'm, this is a, a poor, a very poor summary of the content of Religio Medici, but it was one of the first books that Osler ever bought was a copy of Religio Medici, 1865, when he was still at the University of Toronto. He carried that copy of Religio Medici with him all the time, and it lay on his coffin at his funeral. Um, but during his lifetime, he also put together probably the world's best collection of copies of the works of, of Thomas Brown. Thomas Brown is also, um, being a man of the 17th century, a representative of the most glorious time in English, the, the, in the English language. You know, it's the age of Shakespeare, of Milton, of, 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 of Ben Jonson. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's beautiful writing. Um, and Osler himself deeply admired the artistry of, of literature. Um, he had other books on his bedside. He loved Cervantes' Don Quixote. He loved Bert, Robert Burton's The Anatomy of Melancholy, which is quite a book to keep by your bedside. Um, uh, and he collected uh, in, uh, as, as part of his library, what was called Bad Poetry by Good Doctors and Good Poetry by Bad Doctors, <laughs> and, uh, um, which is, uh, uh, yes, Mike Jones said, Susan Kellen made a presentation on this book at the AOS some years back. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, but I would highly recommend that you, you read uh, the Religio Medici. It's not very long. It's sort of an extended essay. And as long as you, you know, have a bit of background on the period that Brown was living in and realize that this man who is so humane and so peace-loving and so uh, generous uh, in, his, in his judgments of other people, lived at a time when br literally brothers were killing brothers in, in the English Civil War. I think you can appreciate how even in our own polarized age, the values of medicine can become uh, the basis of a, of a humane ethic as well. So there you go. If there's no other questions, yes. And thank you, Dr. Molina, for making this, this, this all possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. Uh, since we're near the end, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague and co-president Arjun to introduce our upcoming event for tomorrow. Perfect. So um, thank you so much, Saman. And uh, I would like to just take a moment to thank all our amazing speakers for tonight. Dr. Dr. Faith Wallace, Brendan Ross, uh, Lily Grossman. Um, I can certainly say that I'm going to be walking away tonight, you know, more inspired, more knowledgeable, and um, certainly more interested in these topics than before. Um, before we conclude for this uh, this evening, I would just like to take a moment to advertise to you our amazing events that's happening tomorrow for our author day. Um, this this year is actually special since it marks the author society's centennial or centenary the hundredth year. So it is very, very special. Um, so uh, we're kind of starting off tomorrow's uh, event. We have our 44th annual also lectureship uh, with our amazing, uh, amazing uh, guest speaker, Dr. Cindy Blockstock, who is actually a champion for indigenous um, community in Canada. So we're really, really excited to, to have her and um, to hear her speak. Uh, the event will be happening at 6 p.m. Uh, tomorrow, and they will be televised on YouTube. You can um, look at the, the chat. I have um, included the registration link. So if you really enjoyed tonight's um, you know, proceedings, like I would very much encourage you to register for the event tomorrow. It's going to be an amazing event. And um, and yeah, please uh, look forward to um, from more information from us regarding other events that's going to be popping up over the course of this uh, next semester or and also next year. Um, as for more interesting events like this. Thank you very much. And thank you, Simon. Feel free to take it away. Thank you again, Arjun. We really hope to see you tomorrow for our centenary and also the 44th lectureship. I'm just going to briefly, again, thank all of you for coming tonight and this evening. I'd like to thank our attendees again, the staff, the Board of Curators, uh, the Library of History of Medicine for organizing this seminar. Uh, represented by Dr. Delmeister, Dr. Molina, of course, Pam and Dr. Delmeister for making this contest possible, Jacqueline for the IT, 
uh, and our amazing presenters, really incredibly rich history to see that our colleagues are doing incredible work in addition to their medical studies, and we have inspiring faculty that we learn from. It's a very humbling experience and uh, very appreciated. So we hope to see you soon. We hope that you've enjoyed this event and you'll be joining us for future events. Thank you very much once again. Wishing you all the very best. Have a great night.